In this lecture today, we will talk about how do we determine cause? How do we determine that a risk factor truly is a cause of a disease, all right? Um, or um, because as you remember, we said that we are interested in epidemiology and measuring the burden of disease, but then also we're interested in understanding its architecture, which comes out of risk factors effects and interventions effects. Interventions are bringing the burden down, risk factors are bringing the burden up. Risk factors can have larger effect sizes or smaller effect sizes, and they can be uh, more or less prevalent in terms of exposure. Interventions in the same way can have larger effectiveness or smaller effectiveness against the problem, and also they can be spread across the population more or less, okay? So their uptake may be smaller or later. So in a funny way, burden is something that is in between, and then you have risk factors pushing them up, and the interventions pushing the burden down. And the risk factors, some of them are very strong risk factors, strong effects, some of them are tiny effects, but some of them are very prevalent in terms of exposure of people, some of them are not, all right? So uh, the same way interventions, some of them are really effective, some of them are not terribly effective, some of them are spread all over population again, and some are not. So think uh, about this in that terms. That is what forms an architecture of the burden of disease. And in epidemiology, we're always interested in relating risk factors with diseases and exploring new and new uh, ways of uh, uh, living and how they affect diseases potentially, uh, new technologies and how they affect diseases. You see, this is a never-ending task, uh, uh, looking at risk factors for diseases, because life keeps changing and uh, uh, behaviors of people keep changing and technologies keep changing. And every time something new comes along, like mobile phones or uh, the internet or whatever, which people start spending a lot of time on um, uh, in a massive numbers, you have to evaluate whether it has any effects on their health. Okay? And the same way the intervention spread, whether it has any issues and whether it's effective. But one thing about the risk factors and one problem with the risk factors is that if you remember what I told you about how we do science, you can establish correlation that's quite easy. You can easily realize that two things are correlated. But whether they're also causally correlated, that is very difficult, almost impossible practically to establish. It's easy to statistically over a certain period of time establish that two things co-occur, but whether they co-occur because one causes the other, or the other causes the first one, uh, or they are both correlated strongly to something, some third effect and there is a confounding, that is very difficult to say, you know? And the way we do science is just not tailored to be able to answer this uh, question of causation. Uh, because of this, farm, uh, you know, there was a lot of uh, court cases in the 20th century against, for example, tobacco industry. But tobacco industry kept selling cigarettes, although there was overwhelming evidence that cigarettes uh, cause lung cancer, that cigarettes cause um, the other types of cancers. But epidemiologically, it was almost impossible to prove this. You know, you can, you can say it with a great deal of certainty that the two things are correlated, but to prove that one causes the other, you need to understand what chemical compound in the cigarette affects which cellular component and how does it change what gene in order to give rise to cancer. And we just didn't have in those days uh, abilities to follow up that whole uh, cycle and, and show in a mechanistic way that one thing really truly over time causes the other thing. We can see that they always come together, but, but so difficult to prove that one causes the other. So you should always think that correlation is one thing, it's good to establish that two things are correlated, but that does not mean that one causes the other. We have even cases of so-called reverse causality when you know, some, one, uh, some, one thing causes the other thing, but then in response, people completely change their behavior. So when you study this, it looks like those same people <laughs> have less exposure to the cause than the rest of the population. And the reason being that they had to change their uh, behavior. So it can be very uh, misleading, all this. Time obviously has a huge component. Okay, so please have 
this in mind and keep this in mind when we go through this lecture because this lecture is going to tell us once you have done your research, you have acquired your data, you have ran your analysis, you've done even your statistical tests and they're all showing that there is a phenomenal likelihood that what the risk factor um, you were studying really is correlated to the disease. That still doesn't mean that they're causally uh, related and you will need to discuss this in your discussion. How are we going to do this? Well, I'm going to take you through the ways in which we try to determine that something is causally related. So how do we determine cause? Typical steps in search of causes of human diseases is usually it starts with a clinical observation that raises uh, suspicion. For example, admissions of young men with testicular cancer seem to be tripling in recent years. Then you gather further data and you generate a hypothesis. So you can firstly check with other colleagues in other hospitals. Are they seeing the same thing? If they start saying yes, then you generate a hypothesis. Maybe they are uh, carrying mobile phones in their pockets of their trousers and maybe there is some problem uh, there. Then what are you going to do? You're not going to start doing a cohort study because it takes 10 years and more and more people may get the disease. You're going to firstly do the quick and cheap case control study. You're going to gather cases from several hospitals and you're going to gather the match controls and look um, for the difference in exposure, all right? Then you're going to do the cohort studies to obtain more reliable evidence. You're only going to start with those that do carry mobile phones in their pockets and take the other group that doesn't, that don't carry this and then you're going to um, uh, go into the future and follow them up and see the difference in incidence of cancer. We said that that is much stronger design, especially if you can take only those who carry it, randomize them and half of them stops doing it and the other half still do, does do it, then you can be quite sure that something's going on there, all right? And finally, this is so the last step, the trial. So the cohort study would identify those exposed and those exposed, follow them and finally a randomized trial would randomly remove exposure in exposed only and follow the outcome. You know, if you have, you start with all of those who are exposed, randomly remove half of them from exposure and you see that there is a difference, that is the strongest possible uh, proof that that was also the cause, all right? Now, as I said, association does not imply causation and you can have reverse causation. This is an example of strong linear association. This is how our brain likes to think about things. You know, you increase one thing, you will see the increase in other thing proportionally, right? The trouble is that in biology, very rarely we see anything even remotely similar to this because of all the multi causality and all the diversity and everything that's happening, we usually see something quite messy. So this is an example of what seems to be an association, but which is a weak linear association. But you know what? Add one dot here and it looks like a complete mess, you know, no longer. So one more data point. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight data points. It looks like a weak linear association. You add that one data point here or here. It looks like a complete mess, all right? So very easy to uh, bring any logic of correlation down. This is what um, no evidence of association looks like. No matter what X is, Y seems to randomly be anything else. They don't seem to be influencing each other, those two things, all right? Now, this is an evidence, obviously, of uh, weak inverse association. Uh, but <laughs> add one dot here and again it's nothing. And this is an evidence of strong inverse association. So you may have association in biology where one thing goes up, the other thing goes down. And this is the problem. You don't know what kind of association to expect. In biology we rarely have just plain linear things. Many, many times we have as, uh, relationships which are, which are non-linear and they may be uh, exponential, they may be uh, going up very fast and then they plateau or they may have thresholds so you go up and then there is a threshold and then you go up again and there is a threshold. You don't know how things work in the body so you can't assume what the relationship is going to uh, look like. You can just plot what you're seeing and then make some inference. All right, so there are many types of true biological associations which you can't predict and you just need to look at your data and let the statistician tell you what this looks like. Is there an association or not? Now, 
What types of causal relationship can we encounter in our research? We can encounter relationships between risk factor and a disease where the cause is both necessary and sufficient to cause a disease. Do you have any examples of this? So flu virus is certainly necessary to cause flu. You can't get a flu if you don't get a flu virus. But is it sufficient to cause a flu? Lead exposure is certainly necessary to cause lead poisoning, but is it sufficient or do you need susceptibility as well? Um, excessive exposure to sun is certainly sufficient to cause melanoma, a type of skin cancer, but is it necessary? You can get melanoma for all sorts of other reasons. Whiskey is sufficient to cause alcoholism, but it's not necessary. You can get it from any other alcoholic drink. But there's also psychological, psychosocial, um, economic issues as well involved. Chromosomal rearrangement and Down syndrome. This is one of the very, very rare cases which I can think of where if you have a chromosomal rearrangement that is necessary to cause a Down syndrome and it's sufficient at the same time. So, um, so very rare are the cases where you have a cause that is both necessary to cause a disease, you cannot get the disease without the cause, and it's sufficient on its own to cause a disease. Very often all sorts of other factors are in the play, personal susceptibility, thresholds, all other uh, mediators or facilitators, and uh, you know they then blur the picture. If it was necessary and sufficient, then you have a very simple graph. Yes, no. Uh, disease present, disease absent. There is nothing in between, you know, perfect correlation. But, um, um, but uh, you know, it's, it's even many times we see people with, um, in, in Mendelian uh, diseases, in, in monogenic genetic diseases, we see people who have the mutation and they should have the disease, but they don't have it. And others with the same mutation have it. So there must be a range of modifiers of this um, uh, along the lines, which also operate. It tells us that this is not, uh, so it's a necessary cause, but it's not a sufficient cause. And maybe it's not necessary, maybe it's some other mutation somewhere else in the genome that affects the same pathway, because there are pathways and there are genes influencing those pathways. And there are many genes because there is a lot of redundancy in the body to make it more robust. So if one thing doesn't work, then there is other thing that takes over and compensates. So because of this, your, uh, your results of your studies are never going to be like these straight lines and zeros and ones. It's very, very rare. You're always going to see a messy picture and then try to make sense of it, all right? Cause can it be necessary but not sufficient? So flu virus, we said necessary to cause flu but not sufficient. BCG is necessary to cause tuberculosis but not sufficient. Cause is sufficient. These are examples of necessary but not sufficient, insufficient causes. So if you have um, mycobacterium tuberculosis, um, um, then you, you don't have to get tuberculosis. You're going to get infected, but many people are infected. Billions of people are infected, but not billions of people have tuberculosis. Obviously, there's all sorts of other things that need to happen for it to become active, right? Uh, flu, the same thing. You, someone can be coughing, but you don't necessarily get uh, the flu, but you can't get it without those two agents. Cause is sufficient but not necessary. Well, smoking is sufficient to actually cause lung cancer, we know that. But it's not necessary. You can get lung cancer for all sorts of other reasons. Irradiation is sufficient to cause hematological cancers like lymphoma and leukemia. If people are subjected to a lot of irradiation, they will develop this. You could see what happened in uh, uh, that example of um, uh, Chernobyl, right? How uh, this was obviously more than sufficient to uh, increase the um, incidence of these cancers by several times, if not 30 times, but that's not necessary because there was always uh, some baseline incidence even before that event, right? Um, okay, so most causes, to make things very complicated, most causes are actually going to be neither sufficient nor necessary. That doesn't mean that they can't cause disease. It just means that they require all sorts of other things to be happening in order to cause the disease and push you 
uh, from health to disease. So the problem with epidemiology is that we're studying causes that can be very different. It's easy when the cause is necessary and sufficient, like in Down syndrome, then um, we're going to find the cause very easily. But what when you have a cause, which is a true cause, but it's neither sufficient nor necessary? So how can we then prove that this is really the cause? Because we're going to get very messy picture, whatever we study, we're going to get messy picture. And how do we prove that this is really a cause? Well, this is a cigarettes per day versus incidence of lung cancer. You can imagine how many court cases have been raised in the United States in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s uh, against the tobacco industry. People were asking for compensation for them, but they were always defending themselves in the courts because they would invite some statistician or some expert who would make a case that you cannot prove beyond reasonable doubt in the court of law that the cigarettes caused the cancer. There was always a chance that the cancer could have developed without the, the cigarettes. So it was impossible to prove the cause because there's always part of people who would not get it and, and you can't prove in any individual case that this happened because of the cigarettes. And then if you can't prove it beyond reasonable doubt, you cannot hold anyone accountable. All right. So look what we had at the time, what people had at the time as evidence. Well, the number of cigarettes per day uh, and incidence of lung cancer. I mean, to an experienced researcher and statistician, this looks like a very strong uh, correlation. So correlation is very strong, very apparent. Um, there's nothing here, there's nothing here. The more cigarettes, the more the incidence. But is it causal? Is it causal? Or do these people also drink coffee and it's the coffee that um, causes uh, lung uh, cancer, all right? So very difficult to prove. And based on this, in 1965, realizing this massive problem, Bradford Hill started developing his criteria of causal inference. So what kind of reasoning, logical reasoning, can you use to infer that something must be uh, causal uh, beyond reasonable doubt? All right? And let's see what these criteria are. He said the first criterion must be temporal relationship. Why? Because the cause must precede the effect. You know, if the <laughs> effect was first in time and then cause started to act, then that couldn't have possibly been a cause. So this is the first thing. He said temporal relationship, cause must precede the effect. This is the only Bradford Hills criterion which must be present if we are to establish causal inference, but it's at the same time the weakest criteria. So it is the only one absolutely necessary whenever you have a, a truly causal relationship. This is the only criterion which is absolutely necessary, but at the same time it's also the weakest because all sorts of things have preceded the effect. And then you see this is the overweight, obesity and hand hygiene compliance. You can, you can put anything in the graph and it's going to look like it's correlated. But so remember, if I ask you which of the seven Bradford Hill criteria, Hill's criteria is the only one that absolutely needs to be met if we are to assume causal uh, inference, it's temporal relationship, although it's the weakest at the same time. It's so non-specific, all right? Now, the second one is the strength of association. That one is really a good one to have. Look, maternal age, a child with Down syndrome, remember this, how the relative risks go up. So the uh, strength of the association is captured with a risk measure called relative risk, which we have studied already, all right? So relative risk is measuring the strength of association, the size of the effect, okay? So when the effect size, um, um, uh, is which is captured by relative risk or odds ratio, becomes quite large, like more than three times, causal relationship becomes increasingly likely. Why? Because the body is so complicated and it has so many compensation mechanisms, there are so many effects playing that, that the pictures are always blurred. So when you get a truly uh, large effect size, that's very unusual because of all these compensatory mechanisms. And, and that usually infers that there must be a causal relationship. So, um, so most true causes 
are actually only having effect sizes of 1.2 to 2.0. So most effect sizes for risk factors that are being explored, you're going to see it to be in the range between 1.2 and 2.0, simply because no matter what effect um, on the organism anything has, the body will always find ways to compensate it somehow and then the effect is not going to be that strong, as strong as you would expect. And then to depend on the ability of body to compensate, you will obviously have um, a reduced um, uh, risk, all right? Now, the third one is dose-response relationship. This is a very useful one to have to infer cause. So, uh, increase in exposure leads to increase in disease. But you have to be cautious because confounding is still possible and thresholds for disease are still possible too. So what does all this mean? You can see here the mortality of naval Korean War veterans in the United States according to their radar exposure. So um, they were looking at very, very large numbers, 19,000, 16,000, 3,000 with low exposure, intermediate and high exposure. And they looked at the total death rates, you know, exposure, uh, development of disease, so morbidity, specifically for cancers and then specifically for lymphoreticular uh, cancer types. All right. So, um, so look how you can see that these people with low exposure had 1.03, then 116, but 306. So in each of these categories, the first and the second uh, group seems quite similar to each other, but the high exposure group seems to be very exposed. So when you have the dose-response relationship um, uh, between the, uh, you know, some effect um, and some the, the risk factor and the effect, that's always a good indicator that there may, must be a causal relationship causing it. But as I said, be careful because it could also imply some sort of confounding um, which is happening in the background and also that uh, you, you can have this picture blurred because may, you may need a threshold for this. So for example, in this case, you can see that uh, low and intermediate exposure don't really seem to have much effect, only when you get the high exposure. So you, you may not see the linear uh, growth, stepwise growth, which you would want to see. You may see uh, nothing, 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 and then suddenly a very high effect. So that would not be the dose response. That would just be kind of like the threshold style effect, okay? Right, now, replication of the findings is extremely important in science, extremely important. So um, many associations were not believed at first. So like Barker's hypothesis is a really good example. Um, sadly, he died uh, in recent years. I, I've actually met him and uh, known him, had an uh, opportunity to talk to him about this. So um, he thought that prenatal and intrauterine causes, um, so anything that happens to you in, in utero, can then have an effect on a very late onset diseases. And actually it makes sense because when you think about it, um, whether you are, when you are growing up in the womb, whether you're getting a lot of um, uh, energy and support and nutrients to build your cartilages or to build your bones or to build your uh, various organs, of course, over time, you will wear out your uh, capacity, uh, mutations will start to accumulate and then the first things that are going to start showing and um, uh, displaying symptoms are your weak spots and your weak spots may have been developed already in utero during your um, early development and each one of us have our own weak spots from that period and then after sufficient enough of time you know some people start uh, getting diseases where they have weaknesses and that's how this works. So no one believed this. They thought, oh, come on. But they started studying it and gathering evidence and there, there's been at least 20, 30 very good studies all over the world that eventually confirmed this uh, hypothesis. Obviously this required a very long uh, follow-up, but the more people studied this, the more they started realizing that this may be true. Then biological plausibility. This is something that is a very interesting but very weak criterion, unfortunately, because once you see a association between a risk factor and disease, which was unexpected, simply, you know, you measure everything, hypothesis-free science, and suddenly you see uh, association between a risk and disease, and you say, oh, I know why this may be, because this gene is known to be involved in this protein, and this protein is known to be involved in this organ, and this organ sometimes gets affected in this disease. So it's funny how uh, scientists, you know, whenever you tell them, oh, this 
gene may be associated with this disease. They're going to come with 10 hypotheses why this may be the case, but nobody would come with a single one if they didn't know this from the study. So you have to be extremely careful because if the study was flawed, there was a bias, there was a problem with the study, and then you got the wrong answer, uh, you will, I, I will bet you that all scientists will immediately think of three uh, reasons why this could uh, be, uh, why these two things could be correlated. And then even if you um, uh, made something up and exposed them to that and said, my study showed this, they will immediately come up with explanations why this is the case. So this is a weak criterion because you, you, scientists will always find explanations to anything. Uh, they are imaginative and everything is correlated to everything else anyway, all right? So it can help if you have a really remarkably specific um, gene and remarkably specific organ and disease. So for example, if something, uh, if there is a gene which is only expressed in thyroid gland, all right, and um, you have thyroiditis and you have a study that connects that gene to thyroiditis and that gene is only expressed in thyroid gland, that is biological plausibility then, you know, that, that is biological plausibility, I would believe that. But I would not believe, you know, just a gene and the disease and then someone making up why this uh, may be, all right? Now, consideration of alternate explanations, I mean, this is kind of, uh, it's good, it's always good to invest as much effort in considering all alternate explanations. Why did you find the correlation or association, as we say in epidemiology, between a risk and the disease? And then try to actively rule out. So make an effort to think of other reasons why these two things may have been correlated and then actively rule out those alternative explanations. And then the more effort you invest in this, the more you will be respected as a researcher and the better your discussion and the more likely for your paper to get published. But the trouble is you can never think of all possible explanations and uh, rule them out. Now, cessation of exposure, this is a good one. Why is this a good one? Because that really brings us down to that randomized control trial design. So you start with all people who are exposed and then some of them are stopping being exposed and then you see that they have uh, less uh, uh, exposure. So, so famous, famous epidemiologist Richard Dole from the UK, Sir Richard Dole, you know, he followed up British medical doctors for more than 50 years. So obviously a very committed individual, right? And um, they all started at 45 and he followed them up to, I mean, uh, he, no, they started earlier, but he was looking at this period between 45 and 75 and this was the cumulative risk of, uh, 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 you know, f uh, of cancer in uh, smokers, uh, of mortality rate actually in this particular graph. So, this is the people who smoke throughout this entire period. Look at their mortality rate. This is the persons who stopped at the age of 60, so they stopped here. Look how their risk started, uh, you know, the divesting from this uh, line and then stopped at the age of uh, 50. Look how these people started having lower mortality and then stopped at the age of 40, 30 and these are the lifelong non-smokers. So it is, it is really uh, exciting to see something like this because this is the best possible proof that this is a cause. Because you dump the cause, you stop getting the disease. And there is no other effect apart from dumping the cause that could have then explained this much difference, all right? Because they, they all started being exposed with the cause and then it's the only difference between them all was that they, some of them were dumping the cause and by dumping the cause they started having less uh, disease. Now someone can say, but there may be a confounding, maybe they were dumping the cause because they were also changing something else. They moved house, they uh, divorced, they this, so, so maybe that's the problem, the moving house, the divorcing, the something else, you know, so you, you can never be completely sure, but this is the best thing we can do in epidemiology, all right? Specificity of association is my favorite one really because Let's say that um, you, know, you have an epidemic of severe food poisoning in your hospital and you're trying to gather data on the affected. And you realize they were all, um, let's say this is somewhere in Guatemala or somewhere, this, they're all younger than 40, they are all Caucasian, they're all presently traveling and they all stayed at this very funny 
uh, hotel, that is going to tell you that the cause must be in that hotel. Why? Because it just there is a specificity, there is a very unusual exposure which is staying in this particular hotel which was present only in a tiny minority of people in the population and then there is a very unusual outcome which is that um, uh, they all uh, got food poisoning, so very small group of people. So when you have an extremely rare exposure and an extremely rare disease being uh, correlated, that's a really good uh, causal um, implication. For example, you remember the chimney sweepers that were very, very important because everyone had, uh, um, you know, um, had fire in, in their home um, to, for, for heating, so everyone had chimneys, you can still see them all over Edinburgh, there's one there, uh, you know, with everyone in the home having their own chimney. So chimney sweepers were important, but uh, they were getting testicular cancer. Um, for, so that, that was a very bizarre association in, in that kind of s s unusual occupation and that kind of unusual cancer. So, so that's a specificity of association, you know, very unusual two things being correlated. It's always a good sign that there is a cause there. And then finally, consistency of findings. That is the last criterion and that is the criterion. So that is the most important one. So if you are, if you are asked uh, in the test or in the exam, what is the most important criterion for causal inference and how do we move from lack of knowledge to knowledge? It is through consistency of many observations. So to make an eventual ruling on causality of associations, we have to look at all the observed data and findings and looking whether they all fit together in a coherent story and if any uh, examples where they don't fit can be somehow explained and only over a longer period of time through accumulation of evidence from many groups who were doing the, the same research in many different places under many different conditions using many different study designs many sample sizes many approaches and it's always getting the same answer only then can you uh, establish uh, or conclude or make a decision that this is a causal relationship because as long as you don't have this accumulate never ever trust a single study. So thinking about the importance of different criteria, temporal relationship is the only one absolutely required because sometimes something really is causal and there are no consistency in findings because of some reason that is difficult to understand. So temporal relationship is the only one absolutely required but it's at the same time the weakest of them all. Excluding alternative explanations or biological plausibility, we said that that's very nice but uh, history proved them both to be very very weak. Those response relationships, strengths of association, so re relative risk, and replication of findings usually do indicate causal relationship, but you always still need to remain cautious about the confounding effects, all right? And specificity and cessation of exposure, they are very strong and very indicative of cause-effect relationships. So this is the weakest, the only one really important, but the weakest. This is a little bit better, but very, very weak still. This is good, this is better. This is fantastic if you can have something like this, but eventually the ruling is only based on consistency of everything that you have studied. That's the ultimate criterion, but unfortunately it takes a lot of time for the evidence to gather. So, if I ask you among the following criteria for causal inference, choose the one which is most helpful in determining the size of the effect of a suspected risk factor on a disease. That is clearly going to be the strength of association. Right? Okay? Agree? Okay? So the size of the effect, strength of vaccination, relative risk measures, all right? Or among the following criteria for causal inference, choose the only criterion which always has to be satisfied, the only criterion which always has to be satisfied when there is a true cause-effect relationship between a risk factor and the disease. So clearly that's a correct time sequence. It's not the uh, any of these other ones because sometimes there is a true relationship but you cannot establish that there is a big strength. Some, there is some true causal relationship with a tiny strength of association, some tiny effects but still true effects, all right? And among the following criteria for causal inference, choose the one which is most helpful in making a definite judgment on cause-effect relationship between a suspected risk factor and a disease. This is clearly 
consistency of association, all right? So once you accumulate enough evidence. Now, what is all this? I'll tell you. Um, these are some creatures living deep in the sea, all right? So, or the oceans. So my first mentor, a very old, very nice Professor Cvetanovic, he, he was uh, leading the infectious disease cluster in World Health Organization in Geneva and uh, you know, through, through some of the most successful period of vaccinating um, the world. Um, he was a wonderful, wonderful person and my mentor and he was probably 50 years older than I was. He retired long before I even started but we met and um, he was very keen to give me some good uh, advice in uh, choosing my career. I really, really liked the man. So he taught me all I needed to know about science and epidemiology through one simple story. He said that somewhere we were sitting next to the Geneva Lake and having uh, lunch and he said, you know, let's say that somewhere deep down in the, at the bottom of the Geneva Lake there is a bunch of creatures and uh, they, can, they were only you know, living at the bottom, rock bottom, in the darkness and never thought of anything more than that. And then there was one creature that one day decided to swim upwards rather than just crawl down, um, down the bottom. So they swam upwards all the way to the top and got out and realized that there is a blue sky and the sun is shining and this was incredible because they knew nothing apart from darkness. And they were like, wow. So they went down and told this to everyone and uh, no one believed them because no one's seen anything, such a thing before, no one's heard of it either. So, but this kind of got uh, one other creature interested, so interested enough to swim upwards themselves and check. And there, it was night and it was starry, so they were like, oh my goodness, look at these dots uh, all over uh, and, and look at this, this big uh, shiny dot and, and this is beautiful, what is in the world is this? So they came and this was a completely different story. They said like, oh, there is an end to our world and, and um, but there is a, it's not a blue or shiny, it's tiny, tiny little dots and then one big one, very interesting, you know. So this was a completely the opposite of what the first one saw, so this really got um, the third one interested and they swam up and it was uh, rain and uh, clouds so and flashes of light uh, you know um, and, and the thunderstorm and they're like oh my goodness and went down and said like no it's not blue it's not uh, dots uh, it's, it's gray and uh, there's water uh, and pouring and there is some flashes of light and everyone was like, what in the world are these people talking about? I mean, this is completely ridiculous. So they formed a committee of the five most uh, wise men and they all swam upwards together, but it was a cloudy night and it was just complete darkness. And they came and said that those three people were completely, uh, creatures were completely insane and that uh, there is something that looks like an end of their world, but it's just the same as everything they've known already very well and that was the conclusion. So basically this story tells you everything you need to know about science. We have no idea what we are investigating. We, we can't have any anticipation for how complicated it will be or how. So we need to be sending many creatures up there all the time, you know, getting a lot of information before we can get an understanding that there is a picture of changes, that there is a, you know, um, and some regularity in it, there is some irregularity. We need lots of information before we can make a definite decision. So never make your decision based on one single study and one single observation because they, they don't necessarily need to be cheating or, or be wrong. They, they may have seen that there for some reason and for some other reason which we don't yet understand, somebody else is going to see something completely different, yet they may still both be right, it's just that we don't understand enough to understand what's going on, all right? So be open-minded and this is why we need to take all the evidence into account, all the observations. This is why we should also publish negative results. The problem with scientific publishing is that it only publishes uh, positive results. No, we should publish all the results so that we can get the full picture because otherwise you have a phenomenal bias towards uh, uh, you know, positive uh, results whereas all the negative ones are hidden. So with that story I think we conclude today's uh, lecture. Thank you very much.